Now this smell is actually really bad. Other oil that I drained was just normal smelling oil, but this smells really whack. In the last episode on reviving this forgotten pile of Kawasaki poo, I made note of everything bad or missing on the bike, built a movable workbench to help out with the project, oiled up all the cylinders, and got the engine spinning freely. I also did a bit of cleaning and discovered some things that led me to believe that this motorcycle has never been started since the accident that took it off the road in 2004. So to see if I'm even able to breathe some life back into this engine, I want to run a compression test on every single cylinder. And to do that, we need to have the starter motor working. And to do that, I need to get a battery and also need to replace this completely destroyed ignition lock cylinder. So, I went out and got brand new ones. The battery was the cheapest one I found on Amazon, and the ignition switch is the cheapest one I found on eBay. Kawasaki pretty much made this exact part for decades with only minor changes, and I was able to find an aftermarket one that looked to be correct and snagged it up for a few dollars. Now I thought I was going to have to use some of these spade connectors and individually connect the wires of the harness to the wires of the new switch, given that the switch here has been crimped directly to what I thought was the main harness, but no, there's still a normal plug. Why was this done when it could have just been unplugged if it needed to be replaced? But looking at these side by side, I can confirm that the new one looks pretty identical to the old one. The wire colors do match up too, so this should be plug and play. And I want to note that a new switch does mean that there's now a new key that doesn't match up to the factory replacement one I got for the helmet lock and seat lock. But I also want to note that I broadcasted that key code to the entire world, so anyone with $10 could have stolen my bike if I got a matching ignition switch. But now, with an entirely new one, someone would need a whole $30 to buy their own aftermarket switch and just plug that in if they want to steal my bike. Neutral and oil pressure lights are on, exactly as they should be right now. And the gauges look to be on too, though it's a little hard to tell- oh wait no, there we go. Maybe one burnt out bulb on the tack up top, but nice, the lights are on. And the tail light and license plate lights are on too, though I think just one of the tail light bulbs are on. But let's see if the switches work. Let's see, we got a turn signal. Uh, nothing. Oh, and yeah, this side, of course it's blinking fast because there's none in the front, but I guess the, uh, just burnt out. Probably, yeah. Let's see if we have, uh, brake lights. Hmm, it's barely flickering. Nothing's happening with the front brake switch. Oh, no, there we go. And the rear one, also nice, cool. I wanted to see if the neutral switch worked too, so I cycled the gear shift to first gear and back. Yep. Oh, how about the horn? That is so adorable. That is so adorable. Only one of the two are uh, moving. What if I, uh, what if I slap it around a little bit, huh? It's both, I guess. Just need a little bit of uh, percussive maintenance. Cool. That's going to be it for electronics testing right now, though. Before I even think about running the starter motor, I want there to be plenty of oil in the engine so nothing will be damaged when I spin it over. This is installed upside down. I'm gonna fix that later. And right now, oil can't be added because there's no gasket for the side cover. 
and I'm thinking that it's the same story for the clutch side cover because there's a fresh little puddle that's formed. Cool. And also, there were a handful of comments on the first episode saying that the left side cover doesn't see oil behind it, but it absolutely does. That is not a stator cover or a points cover where both those things have to be dry, but instead it's a magnetic pickup cover. In fact, here's two months in the future me popping off the side cover just to show you some oil draining out when doing so, and the hole that allows the oil that's pumped onto the timing chain in the cylinder head to drain back down into the oil pan. So this was absolutely a source of the oil leak that I showed. And now we know that the clutch side cover is also at fault. But before I just pop that cover off and spill a bunch of oil, let's first drain that oil properly and also maybe change that filter out while we're at it. But guess what? You gotta take the exhaust off to do that. Cause it's dumb. I fully understand that this is a performance upgrade over the stock unit and it has weight savings, but as far as fitment is concerned, this Yoshimura unit is a pile of shit. It's not just touching the oil filter cover, but it's also conforming around it, so unthreading and lowering it isn't possible without first removing the back half of it. That's annoying, but also... That was easy. You can tell where it was hammered in in an attempt to clear it. There's also a problem with the front half. To make that fit, apparently an oil line had to be pushed way over to one side, causing it to cover one of the two oil drain plugs. Yeah, this bike has two drain plugs for some reason, I realized that when reading the manual, but that doesn't matter because I can't fit a socket on there with that line pushed over because of the ill-fitting exhaust. There were a few comments that suggested that the exhaust was likely for another bike that also had the same engine platform because it bolts up to the cylinder head just fine, but everything after that is where there's a problem. Ultimately, it's not a big deal not getting this drain plug out. It's more than likely just a tiny bit of oil that won't be drained out, so I'm not going to worry about it. Oh yeah, now that oil is golden. Well, I have never seen that before. Okay, so this bike definitely was not run after they tried getting it back together. But that's what it looks like. That is some brand new oil right there. I was hoping that the filter would also be brand new. And the oil looked very golden in there as well when I was popping that off. But nope, that boy is used up and filthy. Ow, F***ing hell. The edge of the filter just cut me. Nice. I guess the previous owner wanted to do the bare minimum and as cheaply as possible, which is always a great sign when buying someone's project. Installing a cartridge filter isn't as straightforward as just removing and installing a spin-on type, what's common on most cars, but it's still pretty easy. Just make sure you lube up all of the o-rings and the rubber on the filter, and put everything back the way you found it. But do double check with the manual first if your bike didn't have competent previous owners. With everything tightened back up, let's take a look at what's going on with the right side cover. Now this smell is actually really bad. Other oil that I drain was just normal smelling oil, but this smells really... There's a lot more oil than I thought there was gonna be. Well, what do you know? There's no gasket. Why? Why? Why in the heck? Is that right? No. No, that is not right. On the clutch basket, there's just scrapes all the way around this entire thing. That is not normal. Not to mention that there's also a little chunk of aluminum taken out of the side of the clutch basket too. I mean, it's tiny, but still, there's a missing piece. 
but that is not the main concern. With any kind of chain in an engine, you're always going to have a chain tensioner, which is this thing right here. It uh, springs up against it so that it's nice and tight. But uh, I'm pretty sure that's not right. There's clearly some damage already done to the engine, but I'm going to see if I can find out a little bit more. Okay. I have done some research and got some stuff in the mail because this is not good. The tensioner is indeed the problem for two reasons. One is this right here. This little metal piece down here, it's supposed to continue all the way around so that this little U-shaped hole is actually just a normal shaped hole. And this little rod on the tensioner when you pull the tensioner down, you're supposed to be able to cock this at such an angle to where it wants to stick in place. So that way it'll hold the downward position so you can remove it and put it back on easily. But even if I were to just replace the entire tensioner with a new working one or a used working one, there's still the bigger issue that these are commonly known for. And that is that occasionally, these like to go down and slide into the clutch basket while rotating. And that is absolutely what has been happening. But I've got a fix for that. With the tensioner off the engine, you can see the damage a little bit more clearly. But that's not a big deal because that is what we're replacing with this guy right here. There are a bunch of different versions of this that are out on the market right now, since this is a known issue that Kawasaki has on so many of their engines. But this fix in particular is from Compton Classic Superbikes. It was honestly pretty expensive, but mitigating catastrophic engine failure is ideal. So getting this one, which is the nicest one on the market, is definitely worth it to me. An installation for this is really straightforward. Firstly, this little spring has to come off. Come on. Next is grinding off the rivet head. I couldn't find my rotary tool for this, so I brought out the big guns. Well, I definitely grinded a little bit too far into uh, the actual frame of the part, not just the rivet. But because it'll be soaked in oil inside the engine, it's probably not gonna rust, so I am not gonna worry about that. The step after lying to yourself is to punch that rivet out. And now for the new piece to go in. The only thing that's tedious and that you need to make sure of is this little tang for the spring going into the machine slot in the new part while also making sure that the slide rod goes into its respective hole. All right, cool. Seems to pivot just fine too. And now the only thing there is to do is secure it in place, and that's with a little pin and a retaining clip. But sweet, this looks great. And the new locking mechanism for the tensioner is very simple. You just have to temporarily take one of the cover bolts and thread it into the tap hole that goes through to the slide rod. And last but not least, the temporary bolt can be loosened up, tensioning the alternator chain properly. The best part about this isn't the refined method for the locking tensioner that's not going to break, but that the tensioner guide physically is not able to fall back and scrape against the clutch basket like it previously did. The guide bottoms out on the new part, and that creates loads of clearance between the basket. This is better than new. So now with that mess sorted, all there is to do is install the cover with a brand new gasket. But of course, first, the mating surfaces have to be clean. Kinda like this right here. I'm sure a bunch of people will tell you a bunch of different methods, but what's worked for me in the past has been to scrape off as much crap as possible with a razor blade, wipe it down with some isopropyl alcohol, give it a light go with a red scuff pad, and then one final wipe down with alcohol. Repeat that a bunch more times over the entire side, and you've got one clean mating surface. But we need two clean mating surfaces, so the same thing was done for the cover. One other thing I wanted to do was make sure the oil passage for lubricating the chain was free of any gunk, 
and that was done by blowing some compressed air into the oil port on the side of the cover. During my time working at Common Motor Collective, Brendan, the owner of the company, taught me to use a little bit of white lithium grease on both the mating surfaces. This does a few things. It ensures there's a good seal, it holds the gasket in place to aid in installation, and it allows you to remove the cover in the future without tearing the gasket, which is a very common thing to happen. The last thing you want to do before putting the cover on, though, is remember. You never checked out the clutch basket. All that scraping, all that marring, there could be serious damage, right? No, no, it's just on the outside. And besides, who's watching me? Nobody. Well, nobody except me. With the cover against the engine, I added in the bolts and tightened everything down. All right. The other side was the exact same process. Remove, clean, lithium grease, gasket, reinstallation. So finally, with all that taken care of, oil can be added. The bike calls for four liters of it if it's bone dry, but because there's always going to be some oil caught in various cavities, especially because I couldn't get that one drain plug off, I'm just gonna go slow and fill it until it's halfway up the glass. If you remember from last time, these bikes are known for the starter clutches failing, so I'm fully prepared for this to just not work at all. Let's find out. Yes! Mm. I'm gonna do that one more time. Nothing. Nothing again. Well, that's not fun. Well, sweet. With that working perfectly now and definitely won't be a problem later on in the video, let's go ahead and run a compression test on this thing. One of the fundamental requirements of having an internal combustion engine operate is the ability to compress the fuel and air mixture. And an easy way to test how well it can do that is with one of these kits. Wow. Now you don't need to run one of these tests. There's plenty of people that get away with not doing one of those. I didn't do one on the Fiero when I got it going, but I went ahead and bought this just because cylinder number one was so rusty and crusty and I want to find out just how bad it really is. So this should go to about 150. Maybe a little less, maybe just around 100. That's okay. As long as it's not freaking zero or something. Yeah, that might as well be zero. Well, I'll tell you what, that's already a horrible sign. Barely got to 50. Well, we can at least check the others and see about them. Let's see what this one says. Cylinder two. Right shy of 100. So that's really good. And how about cylinder three? That's like 125, 120. Really healthy. And four? About 110, 115. So cylinder four. Good. Cylinder three, great. Cylinder two, good. Cylinder one, completely fucked. Let's take one more look at cylinder one. Let's try this again. So it's better. It got to like 65 this time. It most definitely is probably maybe the rusted piston rings inside the engine. From what I've seen on other channels doing revival videos, those stuck rings kind of work themselves free when the engine's running, just with the heat cycling and whatnot. So 
I'm gonna keep trying this. All right, well, it got to 75 that time, which is, keeps getting better and better. Those piston rings are probably just working themselves loose. Well, I did this a bunch more times until I got it pumping right at 100 PSI. That's not fantastic by any means, but it's definitely good enough to run. So that's cool. However, turning the engine over so much with nothing covering the spark plug holes shot a lot of that Marvel Mystery Oil I added out everywhere. Also, I shot a lot down through the exhaust and out onto the bench. And that's nothing a little bit of degreaser on a paper towel can't take care of. But, uh, there's still a ton of it inside the exhaust pipes. I don't want to just burn all that out when I run the engine. So I moved the ratchet strap securing the bike down from between the center stand and the front wheel to between the center stand and the rear wheel. That way it's still secure, but I can also tilt the whole thing back so that oil could drain out. And I did that for a while, also pried up the front wheel to drain even more, and then I remembered I actually have a tool to make this a lot easier. And I also remembered that you need to have that bottle attached to actually make that tool function, but then it came out super quick. But okay, with oil in the system, starter motor working, and ample compression being built along all cylinders, we can finally move on to fuel, air, and spark. Well, at least just spark right now. Taking care of the carbs, the fuel and air, is going to be a very involved process, but the ignition system should be easy enough. The biggest problem is the lack of coils or lack of a coil. There's one on the left side, but the one on the right side is missing. But instead of buying just one new one, I actually found it cheaper to buy a used set of both. And plus, it came with spark plug wires and boots, which are also missing on my bike, so that's really nice. Now, with ignition coils being a consumable part for vehicles, there's no telling if these used ones are actually gonna be good or not. At least not without testing. And luckily, the service manual makes it very easy to do that. All you need is an ohmmeter, or a multimeter, and to verify that the resistance of the primary and secondary coils are between the specified range for each. Couldn't be simpler. 2.4 ohms for this, right within spec, and with the output wires off, 12 kilo ohms for the secondary coil, also right within spec. I tested the other ignition coil too, and everything checked out. Though unfortunately, it wasn't a complete win. See, the spark plug boots don't just act as a connection from the wire to the plug, but also as a resistor. They're supposed to be rated at 5 kilo ohms, and one of them is reading that value. Right on the money. But the other three are completely trashed. I guess getting everything together wasn't that great of a deal after all. So one trip to the local Kawasaki dealership and $70 later, I got these. Brand new NGK boots. They're surprisingly hard plastic and not soft rubber like the factory ones, so unfortunately these won't act as a seal for the spark plug cavity, but they should still operate just fine. And I also did buy a decent length of spark plug wire, just in case any of these old ones have bit the dust. To assemble everything though, I first cut both ends of the used wire back just a little bit to get fresh copper showing. And then one end was inserted into the coil and tightened down, and the other got the boot. First, a boot for the boot goes on, then the boot gets screwed into the wire, then the boot for the boot gets slid over the boot, and then the boot is fully tightened down. And that's what I'm talking about. Same thing was done for every other wire, and now we have a set of coils ready to go on the bike. Since I had to buy new hardware to mount the right side coil, I went ahead and bought new bolts for this side too. So after removing the original one and mounting up the new used one, the input wires were plugged in. The right side coil was also installed, but that one has a little ground strap that's supposed to connect to it, so I made sure to clean that guy up before sliding in the bolt and tightening everything down. Did you hear my wrist pop? Now I wish plugging in this side was as simple as before, but there's some weird wiring going on here. The negative side has a non-factory female spade connector, which technically is fine, but the positive side has a female spade crimped onto an extension wire that's connected to the harness by crimping a female bullet connector between them. Why? But instead of dealing with that nonsense, I'm just gonna cut both of those off and crimp on some new ones. Now with the coils fully mounted and plugged in, 
all there is to do now is snap in some spark plugs and see what happens. Except now pressing the starter button doesn't do anything. Well, the switch no longer works. Nothing happens, but if I bridge the relay, it works fine. Gonna have to look into that, but in the meantime, let's see if we have spark. Nothing. Well, that's disappointing. Maybe if I wire brush the aluminum cover clean so there's actually a good ground, that'll help? Yeah, that's working beautifully. That is definitely a spark. Cylinder four. Also a spark. Cylinder three. Got spark on that one too. And lastly, cylinder two. Also got spark. Heck yes. So that means that we have spark in every single cylinder when I install the spark plugs, that is. But with that, and with compression, this thing is gonna run. This thing is gonna run. So I've been doing some reading and some inspecting on the bike, and I'm pretty sure the issue is the starter lockout switch, also known as the clutch switch. I took that guy off the bike, and it just so happens that it is indeed damaged, for two reasons. One, because the backside busted out and the spring that's supposed to return the plunger forward is missing, and two, the actual contacts inside the switch aren't really working, consistently at least. With it in the position it wants to be stuck in when installed, the starter motor should still be turning on no problem. See, the wiring is set up like this. If the starter button is pressed, the path of electricity now goes to the clutch switch. If the clutch lever is pulled, the circuit is completed and the relay is activated, powering the motor. If the clutch lever is not pulled in, the path now goes to the transmission neutral switch. If the bike's not a neutral, the circuit's not completed and nothing happens, but if it is a neutral, the circuit is completed and the relay is triggered and the bike starts and it's been stuck in that last position, so the bike should be starting. But it hasn't been. So the easiest solution, which is also by far the least elegant, is just to bridge the connector with a little piece of wire. I made sure to do it in the one that requires the bike to be in neutral just so no accidents happen in the future. But that should be it for that. Let's see if it works. Nice! Except not nice, because the ignition coil for cylinders 2 and 3 just started whining very loudly. And that's not supposed to happen. I turned the bike off ASAP, and waited a little bit, and went to try it again. This time, no whining. Still lots of bugs and frogs making noises, but no whining from the coil. There's only one slight side effect of now there being no more freaking spark happening. Great! With everything else from before testing okay, I realized I never checked out the actual computer that controls the ignition. It's a very, very rudimentary computer, but a computer nonetheless. Kawasaki calls it the IC igniter, but the generic term is just ignition module. And the first thing I tried with it was honestly just unplugging it and plugging it back in. And guess what? Spark. 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 Hell yeah. So all there is to do at this point for the ignition system is to get some new spark plugs and throw them on the bike. Going in for the final plugging in, I realized that the wire for cylinder number 3 was a little bit too short after cutting it back earlier. So I pulled that off the bike, measured out and cut some of the new wire, swapped everything over, 
and plug that back onto the coil, and lastly, onto the spark plug itself. And that wraps up the ignition system. All that's left now at this point is doing a full teardown and cleaning of the carburetors, and we can fire this thing up for the first time. I mean, I could spray a bunch of starting fluid down the carbs now and get a few pops out of it that way, but that would just be instant gratification that offers no real progress to the project, and ultimately would be a complete waste of time. freaking yeah, this bike is going to run. I mean, the carbs are completely trashed and need to be fully rebuilt, but this bike is gonna run. I guess I better get to work on doing just that. So, until next time, I'll see you guys later. <laughs>